how did this, um, the idea for uh, the panel that launched this book come together? <laughs> I think, Mike, it might be helpful if you direct the questions because Hugh and I are each going to wait for the other to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, this is Mikey McGovern, and you're listening to New Books in Science, Technology, and Society, a podcast on the New Books Network. The Anthropology of Algorithms is an emerging field of study that aims to account for how constellations of data, platforms, and automation, or, in the favored term of today's authors, robo-processes, shift the distribution of power and profits in our society while shaping the articulation of cultural norms and expressions of agency, among other things. Life by Algorithms, How Robo-Processes Are Remaking Our World, published in 2019 by the University of Chicago Press, is edited by Catherine Besteman and Hugh Gusterson, professors of anthropology at Colby College and the George Washington University, respectively. I feel like in many ways the pandemic has stolen the spotlight from algorithmic surveillance and inequality as the crisis du jour within the humanities and social sciences. Pursuing a dissertation on the quantification of civil rights claims in the 1970s, I partake of this trend myself. Yet, for better or for worse, many of this volume's vital diagnoses speak to a world that will be shaped by more sophisticated contact tracing and even ideas like immunity passports. I don't feel the need to sell anyone on the import of this book, so I'll begin by just highlighting the table of contents as a guide to the conversation I had with Professors Besteman and Gusterson. After Professor Gusterson's introduction, the book's first suite of chapters explores how algorithms categorize. Noelle Stout shows how automated underwriting standards forced millions of homeowners into default. Anne Lutz Fernandez and Catherine Lutz explore how value-added modeling has wreaked havoc upon teacher evaluation. In their chapters, Susan J. Terrio and Keisha Middlemass look at robo-processes in law enforcement, in immigration custody, and felony conviction, respectively. The following two chapters explore emotions. Alex Blanchett looks at how an industrial efficiency metric has shaped the biology of pig reproduction and the dynamics of human farm labor in dangerous ways. Robert W. Gell provides an account of how robo-processes aim to shape human emotions for the sake of their architect's market capture. The final section looks at surveillance, with a chapter by Joseph Masco on the U.S. military's ubiquitous surveillance, and another by Sally Engelmary on how metrics like the gross domestic product can themselves be understood as robo-processes. Professor Bestman's afterward argues forcefully that the construction and use of algorithms must be opened up for public debate rather than shrouded in government and corporate secrecy. I began the interview by asking the editors how the project itself came into being. Uh, Well, the idea is Hugh's. Hugh Hugh came up with the concept of robo-processes, and it was a um, really exciting thing to think within anthropology. I think this is um, one one of the first books specifically about algorithms. Um, but Hugh's conceptualization of robot processes, I'll invite him to um, to speak about it. But this is our this is our he was at our third collaborative book together. Um, so we've we've tried to turn anthropology towards contemporary issues that we think are structuring contemporary life. Um, and robot processes was one that Hugh came upon and proposed as a project that we could uh, bend anthropological knowledge and um, and ethnography towards. And I should say that um, this went through a a quite long process. So it was at least, I think, five years as the volume matured. It began as a panel at the AAA. um, And some people on that panel didn't end up in the the final volume. And 
a bunch of other people were invited to join in. Um, I think what really improved the volume immeasurably is that we were lucky enough to get a small grant from the National Science Foundation to bring all the contributors together for a one or one and a half day uh, workshop at George Washington University. And we used local discussants as well. And so uh, I think that process really helped people to orient themselves to the the way we were conceptualizing robo-processes and to tune into each other's essays uh, and to get uh, good feedback. The other thing I should say is that for 90% of the time we were working on this, we assumed that the book would be called Robo-something, Robo-humans or Robo-processes. Um, and everyone we tried the title out on hated it. They did what it meant. Uh, they wondered if we were talking about artificial intelligence and robots. And at the uh, at the 11th hour, our editor at um, Chicago Press, Priya Nelson, said, it's going to be algorithms, um, which is not exactly what we thought we were doing. And then we realized it was what we had been doing. And um, I think it was a perfect thing uh, for the title. The book's conceptual apparatus engages with prior studies of labor and automation, as well as bureaucracy. And I asked the editors how they defined the range of their subject matter and who they were reading that led to the framework. Well, I think that we were really interested in, I actually think um, that Priya captured uh, what we were trying to get at really well with when proposing the title Life by Algorithms. We were really, really, as anthropologists, we were really interested in the impact of algorithms on on social experience and um, on, you know, sort of the emotional terrain and social relationships. And so uh, our interest was not so much the, the roboticization of work, but more the implications of quantification and automation on each other, how we construct society. Um, and then the, the, the outcomes in the, you know, in the forms that we, that we um, characterize in the book of rising inequalities as a result of the drive towards things like profitability and efficiencies. If I could add to that, I mean, I think we began more empirically than theoretically in in a way thinking about particular uh, scenes in society, if you like, the education system uh, where standardized testing has been so important, the medical system where insurance companies are using algorithms to drive treatment protocols and so on. And then we began to think about um, a theoretical repertoire that could help us think that through. And obviously, in terms of older social theory, Foucault and Weber were very important. Um, But we also came across some people who'd been writing about algorithms who are not anthropologists. I'm thinking of Kathy O'Neill in particular, whose book Weapons of Math Destruction uh, was very important to us. Um, She was a former uh, quantitative analyst for a Wall Street bank who then uh, left the bank and joined Occupy. Um, And Frank Pasquale uh, at the University of Maryland, who's been writing a lot about algorithms, was another important influence on us. It was also interesting for us, I think, to think about um, the leap from the actual work that algorithms do to the normalized acceptance of automation and quantification in other realms of society as well. Um, so I think that we were we were trying to to draw connections across society from the functioning of algorithms themselves to their implications for structuring social life. Some accounts of algorithms tend to focus on their novelty rather than how they build upon existing social practices and distributions of power. And I asked where anthropologists fall on this analytical spectrum. Um, so, as I was saying, I, I'm suspicious of binaries. So my immediate instinct is to say, well, well, both are the case. Um, but in terms of novelty, I do think that algorithms create another layer of opacity, right? So they make it much harder to examine um, the ingredients of a decision-making process. I'm thinking of a recent, uh, quite chilling article I read in the New York Times Magazine about the way college admissions are handled. And it looked at this through the eyes of one particular dean of admissions at a university who was deeply committed to trying to bring in uh, a more diverse student body. And 
um, a week or two from the process where they made their final decision, a week or two from the end of that process, they still had uh, too many people on their scoreboard and they had to cut about 20%. And it turned out that the university's process for doing that is that they contract with an outside contractor with an algorithm. Admissions doesn't know what's in the algorithm. He doesn't know how the algorithm works. All he knows is that the students he really cared about, who came from families where no one had gone to college, often ethnic minorities, they almost all got cut out. Um, So there's a way in which the algorithm seizes control of a process uh, and creates this blanket of opacity so that no one can get inside the black box that I find particularly troubling um, in terms of democratic decision-making. To that, I would also, I think secrecy um, and opacity is, is critically important and, and somewhat revolutionary in terms of what's, what's different now than what has come before. Um, but I also think the lack, what goes along with that is the lack of accountability for outcomes from secret algorithms. Who is responsible then for any particular outcome? Who is responsible, for example, for racist outcome? Um, you know, there's, there's some legal scholars who have been interested in exploring the idea of can you take an algorithm to court for being racist? Uh, and how do you actually try to, try to argue through culpability in those instances? So that's another thing I would add is the removal of accountability. That's, that's fairly novel. The problem of accountability is one that recurs throughout the book's contributions. And I asked the editors whether they dealt with this theme, how to study the way people understand and perform responsibility in their own work. It is, and I'll give you a, I'll give you another example. My last book was on drone warfare, um, and at the moment, the Pentagon is investing an enormous amount of money uh, in creating autonomous smart drones. These are drones that would make targeting decisions on their own, with no humans in the loop. And there are a number of people in artificial intelligence who are talking about the possibility of programming ethics into a drone, so that it would only make targeting decisions in accordance with the laws of war. Now we know that um, where computers are concerned, um, they make bad decisions all the time, right? Um, But it's a very interesting question. If a drone commits a war crime, an autonomous drone with no human in the loop, who is responsible for that war crime? I've also long been interested in questions of who benefits from particular sorts of systems and structures. So I think for me, one of the questions about algorithms that have stupid or bad or unaccountable outcomes is who are the beneficiaries of those outcomes? Who stands to benefit from those outcomes? Algorithms appear to go hand in hand with quantification. Not merely that machine language turns human intelligible speech into bits that can be computed, but in the sense that the inputs and outputs of algorithms are often numbers to which we ascribe social meaning. I asked the editors how the chapters in their book address this relationship and just how central numbers are to robo-processes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really interesting question because I think that one of the things that we tried to show in the book and one of the things that anthropologists are interested in is what happens to social life when people can be reduced to numbers um, that translates them into sort of, you know, commodities that can be exchanged that that are accorded a use value. So I think quantification as a way of thinking about humanity Um, as a way of thinking about social relationships. Um, How does the act of quantification then reverberate or iterate through other domains of life? Um, For example, dating websites, you know, where people get reduced to numbers like their their FICO scores or their, you know, their credit scores, the debt that they carry. Um, And so what what work is numbers doing? What, What are we looking to numbers to tell us about our humanity? It's a really interesting anthropological question. Um, no, I agree with everything Catherine said. And I, I think this numericization of everything is um, one of the most troubling and important processes happening uh, at this moment. I feel it particularly in the higher education system, where it seems that everything and everyone is constantly being rated. Um, you know, academics are rated on alleged quality of the journals in which they publish, right? So the different journals have different scores and you add these scores up when you decide 
whether sh someone should be tenured, how much of a pay raise they should get. Uh, university presidents are completely obsessed with the completely spurious rankings of the US News and World Report um, University League. As if it's really meaningful that you change your position from 65 to 68th in, in that league table. And so we've lost sight of the things that really matter in higher education, which are the things that can't be quantified. Wow. Yeah, and I think one of the important things about Sally Mary's piece is that she invites us to think about the limits of numbers about what's important that can't be put into numbers and the violence that's done to social life when you try and put a number on everything. I think her piece is also revealing um, about the, the, the falsity of numbers, that we imagine numbers actually carry meaning. And what her piece is revealing is how often numbers are just made up because numbers are what is demanded. And so it's the construction of a completely false reality that, that stands in for something knowable. That's really dangerous. One can understand algorithms and surveillance monolithically as an omnipresent Orwellian big brother. However, as some of the accounts in Life by Algorithms reveal, the deployment of algorithms in private enterprise can lead to situations in which systems overlap incompletely and leave cracks for people to fall into whether they work for the system or are caught up in it as subjects. I asked the editors to talk a bit about how the book sheds light on these scenarios and learned more about how the chapters in the book explore the problem of human-machine agency. I guess one of the, the important aspects of Noel's article is the powerlessness of people at the bottom of this uh, the system for borrowing money in, in the, the banking system. And so the people who run the system, the bankers themselves and the regulators, can pivot almost on a dime right, and change the rules on people. Uh, and people below have to somehow adjust to that. Um, different, different chapters and different scenes in the book, if you like, are interested in the agency that people have to resist. And maybe Catherine wants to say a little bit about her conclusion where she talks about different ways of resisting uh, these systems. I think what I found particularly chilling about Noel Stout's chapter is that it lies all the way on one extreme end of the spectrum in terms of the powerlessness of people trapped within this system. Um, and she went on to publish a book about this, and for anyone who's read her book, the people who are powerless are not just the borrowers, um, but the people working for these mortgage companies at the bottom of these huge bureaucracies um, are also quite powerless. She has um, a fascinating uh, anecdote in the book about someone who illegally takes someone's folder home and calls someone uh, facing foreclosure from their home phone number uh, to give them advice that it would not be legal to give them from within the bureaucracy. And he verified that if he gave this advice from within the bureaucracy, it would be tracked by the surveillance system. So even the people within the bureaucracy are, are, are quite trapped. I would just add that um, I think one of the things that for me was most chilling, uh, in addition to everything that Hugh said, is the ways in which these chapters, putting Noel's chapter um, in conversation with Keisha Middleton's chapter, uh, how these algorithms, and, and also with Susan Terrio's chapter, how these algorithms are written to produce outcomes that hurt people. So in Noel Stout's chapter, the algorithms are written to ensure the greatest profitability for banks, not to ensure homeowners get to stay in their homes, uh, but rather they ended up maximizing foreclosures in order to maximize profitability. In Keisha Middlemass, we get a we get a glimpse of how algorithms that predict things like recidivism um, actually function to produce more felons and to make life post incarceration much more difficult for felons rather than reintegrated. And, uh, and then we see in Susan Terrio's chapter the ways in which algorithms are written to make minors more deportable, not to offer them greater protections. And so for me, this also holds, I think, a little key to the possibilities for, uh, for resistance, um, you know, being able to demand accountability about whose interests are served by the ways in which these algorithms are written. What are they written to do? 
Are they written to enhance deportability or are they written to enhance the protection of minors? Now, those are questions that we as citizens have a, have a right to, to ask and to know the answers to. And if I can add one more thing to that, I think what comes through in Susan Terrio's chapter in particular is the capriciousness of a system that's ostensibly um, even-handed and objective. So these rules about how to handle uh, migrant children facing deportation are written in this very bureaucratic way so that they're supposed to be completely even-handed. But what we learn from an anthropologist who managed to get inside the system and track individual people as they went through it and develop relationships of trust with workers within the system, we find that it matters enormously whether there happens to be a bed in this facility or that facility. It matters enormously which judge you get. It matters enormously whether not understanding the system at all, you happen to volunteer a piece of information that condemns you to immediate and permanent deportation or whether you keep that to yourself. Um, so there's this sort of terrifying capriciousness to a system that is supposed to be completely objective and even-handed. And I would just add to that, I think one of the things our book hints at but doesn't probe very deeply into outside of Alex Blanchett's chapter is something he referenced earlier, which is the toll that this takes on people who are supposed to carry out uh, what the algorithms tell them they're to do. And so mortgage brokers who resist, deportation officers who turn a blind eye or change answers, uh, the, the, the workers like Robin and Alex Blanchett's chapter that attempt to mitigate the damage produced by the robo-processing of, of porcine reproduction. That I think that anthropology is really interesting, uh, offers us really interesting insights about the labor involved in attempting to mitigate harm in these systems. That people aren't just being turned into you know, robotic workers that implement robo, robo-process outcomes. They're actually attempting to run interference. They're attempting to interrupt and disrupt, redirect, um, find, find meaning or compassion inside these systems that um, aren't built to, to have those outcomes. And Mikey, you used the word de-skilling earlier. And there are obviously ways in which the system enormously de-skills people. But I think what Catherine is also saying is that it reskills people, that people develop these devious skills for circumventing the system, um, whether it's the, the worker for the mortgage company that feels some connection to a particular person and tries to help them find a way around it, or whether it's the teacher who erases uh, his or her pupils' standardized test scores and fills in the right answers so that they don't get fired by the school because their kids have bad test results. Uh, so sometimes it involves uh, uh, just overt cheating. But there's a whole new set of skills that these robo-processes invite people to develop so that they can survive or thrive in these kinds of systems. This is really interesting. I taught, I taught our book in my Technoculture seminar yesterday, and the students had a big discussion about whether or not algorithms de-skill. And this was exactly their conclusion that, no, they're producing a whole new host of skills as people learn how to sort of manage in the interstices or the undersides of, of algorithms to try, to try to make life better. After all that talk about agency... I asked the editors a bit more about another analytic they use, zombification, and the learned helplessness of algorithmic subjects. Well, I'll dive in first on this. You know, one of the things I'm growing increasingly interested about is the proliferation of uh, new forms of intentional communities by young people who uh, are trying to find ways that allow them to live outside of these modes of zombification, to live outside of capitalist demands, to live outside of um, the reduction of, of everything in social life, everything human to a, a, a quantifiable logics. And so there, there, you know, I live in Maine, and it's been interesting to me to see the, the growth and expansion of these small communities in rural areas in Maine as young people are leaving places like um, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, move to rural areas to get engaged in craft of some form, um, you know, or, or, the, or food, or um, they're, they're becoming makers. And they, they live very modest lifestyles. Uh, it's, I think there's, you know, quite a lot of examples of this in the American West as well. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm beginning to try to pay a little bit more attention to this movement. It's sort of the, the, the current day equivalent of the Back to the Lander movement of the 1960s, I think, um, but with a, lot more, a little bit more of a political orientation um, towards opting out of these, um, what, what you're characterizing as sort of these giant schemes of zombification. I'm not quite sure where this all goes or what, what um, power they can gain, but, um, but I think they're not interested in power. They're interested in opting out and recreating communities in, in very sort of localized ways, communities of care and nurturing and self-sustaining, self-sustainability. So, you know, that might be one, one option is the opting out option. I'll take a slightly different cut into this and, uh, talk about it in terms of the workplace. Um, what concerns me, and this is more impressionistic and anecdotal than a rigorous analysis, I guess, but as I interact with people in bureaucracies, whether it's trying to buy an airplane ticket, visiting my bank, trying to deal with the bureaucracy in my university, I increasingly encounter the response from people, oh, I'm sorry, the system won't let me do that. And then they look over your shoulder. They're ready to hang up on the phone. So I think there is a danger of this kind of fatalist sense of disempowerment that people feel in highly automated workplaces where their ability to exercise agency is literally circumscribed and constrained by the way the computers they operate have been programmed. And there are things they just can't do. And so I wonder about the psychological effect on workers compared to their predecessors of 20 or 30 years ago who had more space to exercise discretion uh, and so on, right? So I think there's a set of questions to be asked about the way people relate to their workplace, the sense of disempowerment they feel, and if they feel that sort of radical meaninglessness and disempowerment at work, where do they go and look for the meaning that they otherwise can't get, right? Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is. There's also the matter of technical literacy. As people become more astute users, even architects, of algorithm-driven technologies, a kind of social learning takes place. Yeah, I think you get both. So you get some people who feel this radical sense of disempowerment, and you get others, they try and figure out how, how FICO scores work, and then they try and get their FICO scores as, as high as they can once they figured out the rules. Um, actually, if I can tell you a, a, an anecdote, Catherine and I recently had a funny experience with this. Um, I was emailed by a student at another university, and life by algorithms had been assigned by their professor uh, to the class. And the student said, you know, this is an expensive book, and we don't all want to buy the book. So if you send us a PDF of the book manuscript, we promise to go on uh, Amazon and write really great reviews so that more people will write your book, will uh, read your book and buy it. So this is a, a classic example of someone figuring out the engineering of the algorithms and trying to manipulate them. And of course, the rise of hacking culture, you know, which is something that I think will only proliferate with, with uh, the rise in, in uh, techno literacy among younger people. Another way to account for the appearance of total surveillance, despite its patchwork nature, is to look at how people connect systems and data sets in practice. I asked the editors what light anthropologists have to shed on this kind of work. Well, I think I think if we turn to look at what China is doing in Xinjiang pro- province right now, Xinjiang Autonomous Province right now, there's a there's a um, an example of an effort to uh, to to create um, universal profiles of people through data mining and uh, surveillance combined with data mining in order to produce a particular profile of every single person um, to be used in the interests of authoritarianism. And, you know, the result, uh, as we've been reading about in the newspapers in Xinjiang province, is the rise of uh, mass incarceration for Uyghur minorities. And that's been put into uh, conversation with the global war on terror discourse that they are, um, they are somehow aligned with Islamic terrorism, which has enabled the, the massive proliferation of re-education camps and prisons 
into which I, I don't know what the current numbers are. I think it was over a million people were incarcerated um, a little bit earlier this year. And I think, you know, the other point that, that Joe raises is not only the ways in which um, this data can be used for authoritarian purposes, but its storage means its future uses are completely unknown. Uh, who, who has proprietary control over this data, over our personal data stored in, in the United States and fusion centers? Um, that's, that's really quite, I think, a terrifying thing to consider. So I'm going to um, answer this question in the context of drone warfare. So if you are using multiple data sets and you're trying to fuse information from those data sets, what you would hope for in an ideal world is that one source acts as a check and a balance on a different source. In practice, in the world of drone warfare, that's not often how it happens. Often, if there's uh, incriminating data from one data source, then that might be enough. And where other data sources might be a check that would urge you to be cautious before killing that person, they're not used that way. So I'm thinking of, for example, the way in which um, U.S. drone operators and NATO allies often use cell phone data to target people. Uh, the drones are constantly gathering cell phone numbers and SIM card uh, registration numbers to identify people on the ground who would be good targets. And so they have a list of these SIM cards. And if they find one that's sort of alive on the ground, they assume if that SIM card was associated a month earlier with someone who was clearly an insurgent, they assume they're a legitimate target. Uh, but actually, in practice, they may have given their phone to someone else, and someone else may be on the receiving end of that drone strike. Uh, also, Western operators get very confused by the names of Iraqis or Somalis uh, or Afghans on the ground. And it's quite easy to have a case of mistaken identity. And you don't have someone with local cultural knowledge checking to make sure that that is the right Muhammad, uh, right, that you're about to target. So in the fissures between these data sets, the incompleteness of the data, the failure to recognize how sources of information can be fluid and mobile on the ground, you have enormous potential for mistakes. Right? And we see this in the US with do not fly lists as well, where you can end up on a do not fly list because you have the same name as someone who should be on that list, even though you shouldn't. And we know that it's enormously difficult once you're on a do not fly list to get your name taken off. Um, the opacity and the weight of the process is such that it becomes bureaucratically almost impenetrable. Yeah, and we see this as, uh, too with associative logics used in different surveillance platforms. So I'm thinking here of uh, work by Ana Munoz, who is not one of our contributors, but who writes about the impact of gang injunctions in Los Angeles, where um, surveillance technology is used as a function of parole, and then data is streamed from the wearer of technology to surveillance centers that implicate uh everybody with whom the person who is wearing the ankle monitor comes into contact. So uh, people enter into the, the criminal um, database system through having a conversation or being in the same room or having a phone conversation or being listed as a contact through any one of a number of ways. And so you become part of a, of a, of a data system um, through implication, through association, in ways that then uh, allow your data to be added to it's it's sort of an accretive process and that's also what's happening in china i think i think this is um this is alarming because there are so many gaps then in how the data about a single person is being assembled from this variety of sources i was somewhat surprised not to see the word privacy more in the book and i asked the editors why that is I think that's a very astute observation, and um, I think you're absolutely right there. Uh, I think the fight for privacy is lost. Um, and it's, it's not just in terms of uh, everything that Edward Snowden revealed about government surveillance. There's also corporate surveillance. We carry around these objects with us all the time, cell phones, that are constantly keeping our location under surveillance, uh, monitoring all of the messages we send, who we communicate with what products we buy, what websites we click on. So the fight for privacy is lost. And instead of 
focusing on privacy, I would focus on transparency. And I think we need to think in terms of, if you like, a sort of bill of rights for the era of algorithms. That bill of rights would focus on issues of transparency. So that if you're on a, a do not fly list, you would have a right to know how you ended up there. And there would be transparent protocols for appealing that decision and getting yourself removed. The very nature of the algorithms themselves should be public so that they can be debated in a democratic uh, form. And everyone should have a right to see what information has been gathered about them by the state and, and by corporations. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we're living in an era now where our homes are even sp- filled with, with smart devices. Your smart refrigerator or your smart TV is streaming data about you um, in ways that you don't even know, including listening to your conversations. My mother told me a funny story the other day about she was um, she was trying to find a show on her TV and she she swore because she couldn't find it. And the TV spoke back to her and said, we don't accept that kind of language. Please use different language. <laughs> <laughs> and she yelled at the TV, I didn't say that. She got into a fight with her TV, who was speaking back at her, reprimanding her. And it really kind of alarmed her because she thought, well, what else is my TV hearing me say? What? And I thought, mom, your TV's hearing you say everything. You know, you have a smart TV. It's listening to you all the time. And so I think, yeah, the, 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 the right to privacy is lost. Uh, but I completely agree that the, that the answer is perhaps not to fight for privacy, but to fight for transparency, to see, you know, what data are, are these massive search chains and smart technology unlocking about us? And do we have a right to erase it, um, for example? Do we have a right to correct it? Who's, who, uh, if, if, um, if there's a data set that includes incorrect information, like, my, like the TV thinking my mother is swearing at it, you know, is there, that's a minor example, but is there a way to go in and correct misinformation or at least challenge the way in which it was collected? For example, as in the gang injunction example I gave before. And not just transparency, but accountability. Yeah. So corporations and governments should have departments and offices whose job it is to be accountable. And people can be profoundly damaged by these algorithms and some entities should be accountable to compensate them for the, the damage that they can, can incur, right? A teacher who is unjustly fired because of an algorithm, what recourse do they have at the moment? None. Amidst so much despair at the prospects of an algorithmic society, I asked our editors whether they see possibilities for liberation and where. Well, I'll name two spaces where there are promising possibilities. One is the original dream of the internet um, as an instrument that makes information radically available to people all over the world with a few keystrokes. I mean, you think of something like Wikipedia, which is extraordinary. Um, I used to have to physically go to a library and spend hours searching for things to find information. Now in my living room with a few keystrokes, it's amazing how much information is available to me. Now, at the same time, we have the problem that the internet is full of fake news sites and it's really hard to sort out what's true uh, from what isn't. But there is that radical possibility um, that makes a sort of intensification of democracy possible of everyone having access to more information than they ever had access to before. And the other um, process that's uh, underway that I'm interested in is automation, the automation of work. I think one of the big questions for developed societies in the next 20 years is as robots and machines replace human labor, um, what kind of society will that enable? One could imagine a society where the profits that come from automated labor are relatively equally distributed and people who used to have very unpleasant alienated jobs on production lines now have a lot of leisure and they can develop their human potential with that leisure time and they would get some of the income that comes from that robotic labor to enable them to do that. Unfortunately, I think it's much more likely that corporations will um, capture all the profit that comes from that and um, you'll see uh, an impoverishment of people who currently have uh, paying jobs. But there is that possibility of, of a world where people 
have more time for leisure and for human growth? I guess my answer to that question would, would pick up where he left off, which is, I, I think, um, I think a really important driver of this system uh, is capitalist logics. And so I think the form that capitalism takes, how far are we willing to allow capitalist logics of extraction, the maximization of profitability, um, and, you know, as a driver of, of, of extraordinary inequality, how far are we willing to allow this to go? Um, and I think that that feeds back into the fights that we'll have over who gets to write algorithms and what do we want to program the algorithms to do. So right now, algorithms are written to, to maximize profitability and extractability. I think as we begin to um, really take stock of some of the ravages of capitalism in producing both inequality but also um, massive environmental collapse. There will have to be a recalibration of the sort of political economic system we want to live within. And that's where the political imaginary opens up about who do we want to be, what do we want to value, um, and then how do we arrive at the sort of society that we would like to live in. That is going to be in part um, engineered through the algorithmic management of outcomes. So, so I do think that a different um, bringing bringing different uh, voices into the political conversations about what algorithms are written to produce will be critically important. As we wrap things up, I asked the editors what they found surprising in the contributions to the volume. I think for me, I hadn't really taken stock of the sort of emotional work that Robo Process demands of employees. That, that was really interesting um, for me to think about and to, um, to come into an awareness of. It comes out most acutely, of course, in Alex Blanchett's piece. But we see it in Noel Stout. We certainly see it in the impact on teachers and the uh, Lutz and Lutz Fernandez piece. Um, and I think I, I was so focused on thinking about algorithms as providing a certain kind of model that uh, was, you know, leaping outside of the computer to structure social life that I hadn't really thought about the people contending with the implementation of models driven by algorithms. So for me, that was very interesting. And also the side of the, of the possibility of a politics of resistance. Humans who, who are unhappy about what algorithms are requiring them to enact and who begin to act in, in ways in, in defiance of those outcomes. I think what was startling to me and depressing was just to find out how omnipresent algorithms are. So as we began to think of topics for the book and people we could invite to contribute chapters, just to realize how many possibilities there were out there, how deeply algorithms and surveillance um, have penetrated all corners of our life in the United States right now. To conclude, I asked our editors what we can expect from them next. Quite a bit, it turns out. We haven't talked about that. <laughs> we, this was one of three collaborative projects that Hugh and I worked on this year, Mikey. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> The two, one of the others is out. The other one is about to come out. <laughs> um, so, so that those are just winding down. Um, for me, I'm just finishing another book project on uh, militarized global apartheid and security empires. That I'm looking quite a bit at the use of biomet the biometric border, use of biometrics in combination with surveillance technologies to um, to thicken and offshore borders and to, c to control mobility. And it's been a deep dive into biometrics in ways that have totally startled and fascinated me. And I've been working on a, a solo monograph um, and just wrapping up the fieldwork on the polygraph, the lie detector. Uh, and I spent 10 weeks this summer training as a polygrapher. Um, so one of the things that's interesting is that polygraphy used to be a craft where individual polygraphers would score charts somewhat differently from one another. And some polygraphers were highly regarded and respected, and others were not. 
And increasingly, polygraphy is being overtaken by algorithms. So when you score a polygraph chart now, half of it is scored by human hand, and the other half is pre-scored by the computer. And they expect that ratio to shift over time. Uh, so it's yet another space where human judgment, um, human intuition is being displaced by, by algorithms. Um, and people don't pay much attention to polygraphs, but there are a number of jobs around the country that you will not get if you fail a polygraph test in your job screening process. Uh, if you're a sex offender on parole and you fail a polygraph, you may well end up back in prison. Um, so what these algorithms conclude uh, can have very important life-shaping consequences. Thanks so much for listening. This has been another episode of New Books in Science, Technology, and Society, a podcast on the New Books Network. Thank you.